Hi, and thank you for taking time to watch this presentation today. Um, so for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the current issues and challenges we're seeing in the IT supply chain and the things we have seen over the last kind of two or three years. Um, I'm also going to share some stats and figures um, for some uh, research that we've done uh, fairly recently. Um, and then more importantly, uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about some guidance and advice in terms of how you can overcome uh, all of those challenges uh, in the education sector. So just to start off and explain briefly who I am. Uh, so my name is Ian Nethercott. I'm the Supply Chain Director at ProBrand. Um, I control an annual IT spend of 35 million a year. Uh, I've been in this uh, in this industry now for uh, 20 years, um, so I have no idea uh, where the last 20 years have gone. So I've been through quite a lot uh, in the IT space. We've seen lots and lots of changes um, uh, over the years, um, and obviously some of those I'll summarise in this in this presentation. Uh, I've done many things um, in uh, IT procurement in speaking on this topic. Um, so I appeared on BBC Newsnight and ITV News at 10. Uh, when the pandemic first broke, uh, talking about uh, kind of the impacts on the supply chain. Uh, I've also done things in the SIPS CPD knowledge base system um, and various uh, kind of trade press articles and things like that. So uh, if you want to talk about IT procurement, then uh, please certainly uh, connect with me. So I wanted to start this presentation uh, really just framing actually what the IT supply chain looks like. Uh, this is a uh, this is a really common um, theme uh, when I'm when I'm talking to uh, clients and customers that there's a lot of misunderstanding about really what a true authorized IT supply chain looks like. So I think that. It's quite important, really, that I that I kind of cover this. This kind of really anchors um, a number of the areas uh, that I'll cover in this in this presentation. Um, so we've got a multi tiered supply chain. Um, essentially, at the at the top of the uh, supply chain is really where the manufacturers sit, like the vendors. So these are people like the HPs, the the Dells, the Lenovo's, the Samsungs, the Cisco's. All of the well-known brands that you would uh, you would uh, you would know and understand. Um, that's that manufacturing layer. So they really sit at the top of the uh, supply chain, and each of those manufacturers has a set number of authorized distributors. Uh, that they sell through to, uh, that number of distributors can differ. Um, it, it could it could be um, anywhere between one and up to maybe ten or more. It just it very much depends um, on the brand and category. But it, it, there's generally probably around a, a, an average of about three to four maybe um, per manufacturer. Um, and those are the distributors um, that will uh, that will fill their warehouses of inventory uh, for that manufacturer to distribute around the UK market. So those are the authorized distributors for the manufacturer. So that's the second tier. The third tier to that will be the resellers. Um, so that's where I'm from. So that's ProBrand. We sit as a as a reseller in that third tier uh, in the supply chain. So the resellers will buy uh, typically from that distribution layer. And then the resellers will sell on to end customers. Um, so you guys, I guess, who are watching this presentation, uh, you will be the end customer um, in this scenario. So that's the fourth tier uh, in the supply chain. Um, where, where this kind of gets more complex and more confusing is that um, there are sub tiers that can start to exist uh, within the supply chain. So what I mean by sub tiers are um, is where you can have a scenario of distributors buying from distributors and selling on. You can have resellers buying from other resellers and selling on. Um, so there's, 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 there's multiple extra layers that can happen. And when this happens, it means it really then turns a an authorized supply chain into a non-authorized supply chain. The reason it's non authorized uh, when the sub tier is involved is because you're then losing the traceability and you're losing the governance across that supply chain. Um, and the manufacturers, uh, when they support you directly as an end customer, they only care about when you buy from an authorized supply chain because that is how they get recognized for the sale. That is how the 
sales representatives in those manufacturers actually get paid on the business that you do um, and, and how they're driven behind their targets and all these kinds of things is all governed through an authorized supply chain. So um, so, so the sub tiers that exist uh, start to add complexity to that. Um, and that's really what we want to try and avoid. We want that clean kind of authorized supply chain. So that's really some of the complexity uh, from us from a supply chain perspective. Um, but then we've got all of these things that we've been peppered with over the last few years. Um, this certainly isn't an exhaustive list uh, at all, but this is some of the some of the key areas um, that's really had an impact uh, on the supply chain over the last few years, and, and really what's what's led to uh, some of the challenges where we are today. So. Clearly, um, uh, you know, the pandemic itself is, uh, uh, you know, is, is a pivotal part in, in all of this. And that's really been the root of, of, of a lot of the problems where we are today. Uh, outside of that, we've seen a whole number of things, um, you know, container shortages that we had. Um, that was in the, uh, again, in the height of the pandemic, there was a, a shortage of containers, which means goods got, got, got held at ports. Um, uh, and but but equally, it, it caused shipping prices to go through the roof. A, a shipping a container went from like five thousand dollars to twenty five thousand dollars. That you know, so that bumped prices up even more in the supply chain. We obviously had factory closures um, over in China and around the world due to the pandemic. Uh, we then even had uh, you know a, a ship blocking the Suez Canal, which um, uh, you know which which caused a whole manner of problems. So. Those are just some of the things um, that, that that we've had uh, to, to to deal with um, over the last few years, um, and that's really been the result of some of the uh, challenges in the supply chain where we are today. So the the, the market really has, um, in my opinion, has never been in in such a volatile state uh, as it is at the moment. The IT category has always been. Uh, volatile to a degree, but yeah, never as much um, as, as it as it is right now. Um, and really, what I'm referring to here is is volatility around pricing and stock availability and supply uh, in the market. Um, so, firstly, from a price perspective, um, you know we've seen everything in an upward trend uh, in in recent times, as as everything is in the world around us. Unfortunately, at the moment, um, IT is certainly no exception to that. Uh, and I've seen, uh, you know, blanket price increases from some of the main tier one IT vendors um, happening continuously just over the last uh, 12 months alone. There's been, you know, maybe three to four blanket price increases on some of those vendors. Um, but everything in and around that um, changes as well. So not just when there's a, um, a set announced sort of price increase there's other factors uh, that can influence the the change in price that could be uh, down to general market conditions supply and demand uh, it could be currency fluctuations um, you know th there's a whole number of different different reasons why that might be um, on top of that there's also lots and lots of new products that's flooding the market as well you know we, uh, technology is, is moving at such a fast rate at the moment um, and, and obviously when new products come onto the market that causes an imbalance between uh, pricing for new and old uh, products so obviously when those new products come in um, they'll come in at a higher price typically the older products can change in price and, and things like this so all of that causes this imbalance and it's really difficult to try and keep grasp of all of that rate of price changes. I mean, we've seen, um, you know, in excess of 30,000 uh, price change in a single day uh, before. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's very, very difficult to keep uh, keep on top of that. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on in terms of maybe how you can overcome that. Um, second to that um, is, is around stock availability. Um, it's fair to say we've all been hit with supply chain challenges uh, in recent times. Um, there's been some really severe um, product constraints in the IT and technology space. Um, thankfully, we're in, a, we're in a much better position than what we were 12 or 18 months ago, um, but there are still some major categories uh, in constraint, uh, certain categories in, in certain areas um, to be aware of, but uh, we are in a much better shape now, which is great. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really difficult to keep on top of that. You know, stock changes all the time. Stock is absolutely king. Um, and, and stock isn't generally staying on shelves for very long at the moment. You know, that demand for technology is really increasing. 
there's lots and lots of digital projects, digital transformation projects um, in the market at the moment, which means the demand for tech has never been as high. Um, so when stock is on the shelf, it doesn't stay around for long and it's gone. Um, so, so again, it's another area that's really difficult to, to try and keep a, keep a grasp of. And all of this creates uh, kind of time constraints. Um, it's it's time that's that, that you're going to burn that trying to keep on top of uh, managing price and stock availability for for the procurement for your organisation. So I guess that really uh, leads me on to this uh, this next slide. So this. Um, here is taken from um, a piece of research that we did um, at the tail end of last year uh, around digitalization. And we wanted to understand where organizations were on their digital journey. Um, uh, this is this is one of the pieces of information I wanted to take from that report. Um, and the, the whole report actually um, is available. Um, uh, please go onto our website and you can uh, request a copy. Uh, of the full report, some very interesting reading in there. But this one in particular, um, I, I thought was very relevant to this particular presentation because this is really asking the question of how long do you actually spend manually researching this information around pricing and stock availability in the market? Um, and as you can see from this data here, that there's 25% uh, of people that uh, we spoke to uh, are spending uh, at least a working day a week uh, researching uh, IT purchases and price and stock availability. And that's just quite simply way too long. Uh, you know, there are much, much better ways uh, of doing this now. Um, there's too much time taking up doing this traditional work of calling suppliers to check prices calling round suppliers to check stock availability. Um, and, and what you find is, you know, this, this work is often duplicated as well because you'll go and do this piece of work and then by the time uh, you're ready to place your purchase order, all of that has changed. Maybe the price has gone up or maybe the stock has gone or, you know, uh, and then you've got to go around and, and do all that piece of work again. And so you're just duplicating your efforts. And, and this is very manual work that, you know, you want to be spending your time doing more strategic thinking, more kind of commercially minded procurement work than just picking up the phone and checking this data. Um, that And there's much, much better ways of doing that, which I'll cover off um, a little bit later on. Um, uh, you know, and what you'll find is that that actually stock data is is often not accurate as well. You know, there are lots and lots of IT suppliers out there um, that don't have live data sources. Uh, that live data sources are available out there um, that you can get this information through to save you doing this piece of work. Um, but actually, there's lots of suppliers that just don't have access to this data. So when you're, they're giving you stock information. How up to date actually is that? And there'll be a lot of instances where it won't be. It will be quite out of date. Could even be a week or more old in terms of that stock availability data that they're providing you. So that's something you need to ask the question um, of your suppliers. Uh, but stock and price aside, it's also doing that piece of work around comparing, um, you know, kind of technical specs and op te technical specs and options of equipment. Uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, is is quite a time cumbersome thing to do as well. You know, you can look at a um, an IT device like a laptop or something like that. You can look at three or four different ones, and they can all look very similar. Even the prices can look similar. Um, so you've got to understand right, what actually the difference is between these things. And again, that takes time uh, and effort to do that as well. Um, so this is certainly an area where uh, more efficiency needs to be uh, needs to be driven in your organization. The, uh, the next piece uh, from the same uh, same research that I wanted to share with you was um, another question that we asked was, you know, just how um, how much do you believe that you're getting good value from your IT purchases? Uh, this was quite uh, quite frightening, really, in terms of the response here, because more than half uh, of the of the people that we spoke to told us they were uh, either unsure or they didn't believe uh, they were getting good value, uh, you know, and that that just isn't isn't good enough. You know, IT will always be one of the largest areas of indirect spend for any organization. Um, it's it's a category that we have to be confident that we're getting good value from. So the fact that so many people telling us they're not or they're unsure, uh, something definitely needs to change here. 
And then the uh, the final kind of stats really that I wanted to share with you um, was uh, around, this was actually a separate piece of research that we did around benchmarking uh, across the IT sector. Um, and uh, we wanted to understand actually what margins um, organizations from different sectors were actually paying against their IT purchases. Uh, so we, we spoke to all different sectors, um, uh, but you, as you can see on this slide here, the uh, from the education sector alone, uh, the highest uh, margin that we saw was was over twelve hundred percent margin, which is which is quite frightening uh, to see that that kind of thing uh, is going on out there uh, in the in the marketplace. Um, and we saw you know average margins across sectors of fourteen percent on all IT. Uh, but remember the, these margins that I'm talking about here; these are margins based on um, the standard channel buy price so that is the buy price that the resellers are paying the distributors so remember that third tier uh paying the second tier in that supply chain that i spoke about at the beginning of the of the presentation uh these are these are the margins based on those prices um the positive news uh for you guys as education um uh, organizations is that actually uh you can do much better than this there are a whole number of ways that as education customers you can leverage even better uh, margins and discounts uh, which I'll uh, move on to right now. So the first element here is uh, education framework prices. Um, this is definitely an area that um, I truly believe that um, most education customers will not be getting getting access to. Um, so just to really explain what this is, so there are lots and lots of IT vendors in the supply chain who already do pre-approved education specific discounted prices. Um, uh, there's lots of vendors that do them. It's It's been going on for many, many years. Um, uh, but unfortunately, um, in a lot of instances, these discounts do not get passed on to customers because the reality of what happens in the supply chain is the distributors and the resellers in the middle, so that second and third tier, um, often swallow up that discount um, and don't actually pass it on to you as an end customer. So it means they make that extra margin for themselves. You're then going to pay a standard price, in inverted commas, uh, and and the uh, those resellers and distributors in the middle, uh, they'll make that extra profit uh, for themselves. Um, so um, it's really important that you um, you get access to these kind of discounted prices. Um, and these are available to you. I'll talk at, at the end um, about how you can uh, how you can do that. Um, uh, but that's something you definitely need to be aware of. And and, and actually, um, in a lot of the framework agreements uh, that exist out there, even things like Crown Commercial Services and uh, various public sector procurement frameworks, um, a lot of these specific education prices actually don't even exist inside there. And the reason being is because those platforms and those procurement platforms of those frameworks um, do not carry the ability to surface multi-sector discounts because obviously in these frameworks, there's there's a whole number of different public sector organizations procuring through there, not just education. And they don't have the technical capability to identify you as a, as a particular segment and surface specific prices just for you. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, just because you're maybe buying through a particular um, framework agreement, uh, don't automatically assume that you're getting access to specific education prices that exist. Um, next, that will be uh, volume discounts. Um, volume discounts kind of speaks for itself what it is. Obviously, if you're going to buy a volume of something, quantity of something, naturally, you're going to want a better price. That's completely understandable, um, especially when you're talking a, a considerable number of units or something like that. So um, so when you, uh, when you um, are buying volume, um, those volumes will trigger discounts within the IT vendors. And the IT vendors will have um, different rules that trigger those discounts. Um, and those rules can be based on a different set of metrics. So it could be 
um, down to the uh, volume that you're buying, the actual quantity of goods. It might also be down to the value of what you, you're buying, the actual revenue, the actual spend level of those goods. Um, it might be determined by the sector that you're in. Um, it could be right down to the individual product SKU. Obviously, some SKUs are more margin rich than others, um, which means um, the actual trigger for discounts, the volume will be lower because the margin in those individual SKUs are higher. Um, so... Um, so those uh, those triggers um, achieve what we call special bids, um, and special bids is a terminology uh, in the industry um, that that is really a, um, a a dedicated pricing structure, a pricing catalog specific for your organisation. That is what a special bid is. So it's something that's a that's a kind of if you like a written pricing agreement that the vendor has committed a price. To, to your organization for a particular period of time. There'll be usually um, a longer validity period against those pricing structures. Um, uh, and that'll be fixed just for you and based on a particular volume that you've said that you're going to buy or you believe you're you're going to buy. Um, so uh, so special bids is something um, that you, you should be driving, especially when you're buying in, in volume. Um, and then the final thing on here is just really down to just general advice on the devices you're buying so uh, that's what I really mean here by form factor so uh, the equipment you're buying is it fit for purpose for the education sector you know is it um, uh, is it the right process is it the right um, form factor uh, as in the size uh, of, of the device um, is it um, the right operating system you know there's uh, there's lots of products and specifications that's tailored specifically for education so and you want to be working with um, partners who uh, who have education specialists or people who um, have the technical knowledge to provide you the right guidance and advice on the equipment that you're uh, buying for your establishment. So I wanted to really now hone in on um, some really 10 top tips um, uh, in, in terms of where I can give you some guidance and advice on how you can overcome uh, some of these challenges that I've been through uh, in this presentation. Um, so there are uh, certainly some ways to do this. Um, so um, so yeah, um, let's let's cover these off now. So, so number one is um, a very, very simple one. So quite simply ask suppliers about education pricing. So these uh, education framework prices I mentioned on the previous slide, just go and ask your suppliers about them. You know, uh, the, you, you complete within your rights to ask everything you buy ask you know is there an education discount on this price and your supplier will probably actually be quite um surprised you to ask this uh question because they'll expect you probably don't know about them um so uh so it's going to put you in a good uh light with your supplier as well um they'll realize that actually you understand the industry you understand how uh, discounts are leveraged and so ask your suppliers about them uh, everything you buy uh, ask the question because those education discounts um, are usually not governed by quantity. So you can buy single units um, at those education discounted prices. So just start to ask the question um, of your suppliers. Second to that um, is around digital. Uh, this is arguably um, one of the most important uh, um, sort of tips on here uh, that I'm going to go through. Um, digital um, is 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 where you need to be thinking about if you're not already. Um, if uh, if you um, if you're a SIPS person or if you um, if you follow or read uh, the SIPS supply chain management magazines. Uh, just a few editions ago, the chairman of SIP said uh, right on the inside front cover, a uh, big headline that said, you know, if you're not on board with digital, uh, then you're going to get left behind. And that is absolutely true. There are um, lots of ways now that you can be driving far more efficiency in IT procurement. Um, as I said before, uh, the IT category is, is, is a big complex area. It's one of the largest areas of indirect spend. It's a category that you have to drive efficiency through um, uh, and you have to be slick in how you do that. And digital is absolutely the way to do that. So there's lots of uh, things you can do to um, 
to automate and digitize some of those processes in terms of how you go about um, uh, uh, sourcing stock availability, how you get prices from suppliers. Um, it's something we do as an organization, as ProBrand, we can help um, with how you can do that digitally. We have a platform solution that does that, which I'll talk about at the very end. Uh, but there are ways that you can do this to drive more efficiency in your organization and give you the time back to do more meaningful and more strategic tasks uh, that you want to do. Um, and and what, one of the very, very simple things I can advise here is, you know, take a step back, uh, document a list of um, all of the kind of manual processes that you're undertaking within your procurement department um, and, and, and prioritize that from the highest um, in the list in terms of the amount of time uh, that, it's, that it's taking you to do that particular task and start to pick off those tasks one by one and try to digitize and automate each of those tasks. Um, and that's probably a simple and easy way I can advise you to start to do that. So number three is uh, to seek transparency across your supply chain. Um, so really, I, I guess I'm picking up here on, um, go back to the first slide when I was talking about how that authorized supply chain works. Uh, and I mentioned around those sub tiers, those sub distribution, sub reseller layers. Um, this is really what I'm referring to here. It's, it's important you understand actually what your upward looking supply chain looks like. Who are your suppliers and where do they sit in that supply chain? Um, you know, a few, few things I'll, I'll advise here. Go and look on the uh, websites of the suppliers that you're dealing with. Uh, you know, look at the About Us pages, see how they describe themselves, see who they are. Are they a reseller? Um, are they, um, uh, you know, do they hold accredited um, certifications in certain areas with some of the vendors? You know, look for their partner statuses with those vendors. That's something I would expect to see. Um, if there are if there are true reseller in that authorized supply chain, so look for those accreditations. Look at what they describe themselves as, and ask them the question. You know, ask your suppliers where do you buy from. You know, do they buy from distribution? That's what you want to look for. But are they buying from other resellers? Or you know, so look for those red flags. Ask the question of your suppliers. Um, who do they buy from? What does their supply chain look like? So that's really important. You have um, an understanding of that. Um, uh, next to that, uh, number four is around comparing the market for education products. Uh, so as I touched on uh, previously, there are lots of products now that are out there that are specifically designed and manufactured for the education market. Uh, this could be uh, maybe the operating system that a device uses. It might be the materials that are used. It could be, um, you know, more... Um, you know, uh, sort of uh, budget sort of materials that, that suit the needs and the price points for education and, you know, things like that. So there's lots of these products that exist. So uh, look at look under the hood at the products you're buying and check that it's something that um, is fit for the education market. Is it the right price point for the education market? Um, because there are options out there. And as I said before, lean on your suppliers for that information as well. You know, you're not expected to know everything uh, from a technical nature about every product that's what your suppliers should be there for so um you know if you're dealing with suppliers um uh with uh with education teams or uh technical teams that's what you need to be looking for um speak to those people uh understand the um the right things to look for in the products that you're buying um uh, and, and make sure that's fit for purpose for your organization Uh, so number five is uh, increasing supplier engagement. Um, this is really around the communication you have with your supplier. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is is really down to, um, uh, I guess, try to co to combat the whole supply chain availability, lot stock availability in the supply chain. Um, and and because the more you communicate with your suppliers, the more of an understanding they have about your up and coming requirements the better um, that stock availability can be forecasted within the supply chain. So it's important that you have regular engagement with your suppliers, Have think about doing reviews or quarterly reviews with them. If you're not doing that already, I would highly encourage you to start to do that. Um, and your supplier should also be asking you for this as well. Uh, you know, they should be um, paying attention to your projects and your demands and needs and those kinds of things. So uh, certainly a two-way thing, but make sure that happens between you. Um, because, you know, 
you need to be thinking about your projects for the next six to 12 months, even beyond that, and discuss that with your suppliers, make them aware of what your forward-looking plans are. Um, and what your suppliers should be doing is communicating that with the vendors in the supply chain. Um, so the vendors have a good understanding of what um, what projects might be on the horizon and they can then uh, therefore forecast that with a factory to make sure the, the relevant inventory is physically produced and manufactured uh, and brought into the UK uh, for those uh, for those kinds of projects. Um, next to that is, is really around looking for flexibility in your suppliers. And this is really from a logistics perspective, what I'm referring to here. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are lots and lots of suppliers in the IT space who do not have their own logistics infrastructure. Um, there, there are lots of suppliers who are purely reliant on that distribution tier, so that second tier in the supply chain. Um, so think about dealing with suppliers who actually do have the capability from a logistics perspective. Look for suppliers who maybe have their own warehousing infrastructure um, because those suppliers then should be able to offer you additional value added services such as uh, you know things like bonded storage so where they can actually hold and ring fence stock for you for call off so if you don't either don't have the space or the capacity to, to bring in big volumes of stock for a project um, you know you can lean on your suppliers to help you with that if they've got their own warehousing facility uh, they can maybe offer you value added services um, around that as well. So certainly something to look for at the moment within supply. So again, ask the question uh, with your suppliers if they have their own warehousing infrastructure. And if they do, ask them what value added services they can offer you. Understand more about the logistics services uh, that can be provided for you. So number seven uh, is engaging with industry experts. Um, so uh, so people like me, and there's lots of people like me in the industry as well. Um, so think about engaging um, with those experts to to kind of keep your ears to the ground, really, in terms of what's happening in the in the sector and in the space. Um, it's important you 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 try and get ahead of the game as uh, as far as what that looks like, because the industry is moving very very quickly. Things are changing all the time. So think about connecting with these experts. LinkedIn is a fantastic place to do that. Um, so I know I certainly uh, push out a lot of content. Uh, through LinkedIn uh, as well, so um, as do other people. So LinkedIn is a great place to start to do that. So follow the and connect with these people on LinkedIn um, and just to keep ahead of the game uh, as far as what's happening in the industry. Um, number eight, a little bit similar, um, uh, but subtly different. So uh, this is really around reading blogs and articles um, for industry updates. Um, so get yourself on mailing lists um, uh, from um, you know people in the in the, in the trade uh, from your suppliers. Um, you know you you want to be looking for your suppliers to be pushing out content of value to you. So articles and blogs, things that are happening in the industry. As, as I said before, things are moving really, really quickly. Um, it's a great way to try and keep ahead of the game as far as what information and what, what things are happening and changing uh, in the industry. Uh, number nine is uh, around sustainability. Um, sustainability, um, uh, uh, you know, is, is becoming a really, really big topic now out there across lots and lots of organizations. Certainly in the education sector, in the public sector space, sustainability is a very, very big thing. Um, so there's a few things you can think about here in terms of how you can uh, kind of think more green, think more uh, sustainable in terms of your procurement approach. Uh, one of the things is, um, you know, maybe thinking about refurb equipments. You know, it's a very big thing in education. Um, there are um, some very reputable refurb um, producers out there now. They've, they'll take devices from the market, as in laptops, desktop devices, those kinds of things. They'll refurb them to a great standard and they will sell them back out into the market at, at, at fantastic prices, but really good value behind them as well. So they can have long warranties on them. They can actually sometimes have, um, or actually quite often have, uh, longer warranties than buying brand new. You know, they, they often come with at least two year warranties. Most brand new devices have a year uh, if you don't buy an extended warranty for it. So that's certainly something to, to think about as well. You can save some really good money on buying uh, refurb. Some of the other uh, things you can think about as well is from a logistics perspective. So um, think about consolidating what you buy, um, maybe having one delivery every week um, to cut down on trucks on the road or less packaging and those kinds of things as well. So, um, so that's something else to think about on how you can be green. 
Also look at the product itself, kind of a little, little bit similar here to number four uh, on this list. Um, but there's lots of products um, that are made from recycled plastics and things like that now as well. So look at the physical um, aspect of the products that you're buying. You know, there's things like laptop bags now that are made from recycled bottles and those kinds of things. So something else you can think about in terms of the actual buying decision uh, that you're making. Um, and then finally, last but not least, um, is around consolidating uh, spend. Um, so um, this is something where you can drive uh, better value uh, in terms of your procurement. Um, it's also great for your IT teams because um, you know, IT teams will want um, to to kind of standardize on on brand and technology type across your estate. Um, so, if you're buying, you know, ten different types of monitors or ten different types of docking stations or something like that, look at bringing that together and consolidating that. Because obviously, if you aggregate that spend together and you align with a particular brand and technology, that's going to help you drive better value and drive a better price with that vendor because you're bringing it together as one. You're not diluting your spend across a bunch of different uh, uh, brands and, and, and manufacturers. Um, so that's something to think about. A big tick in the box, as I said, for your IT team as well. Uh, they'll love the fact that um, you're going to standardize on, uh, on particular devices across your um, IT estate. So that's it. Thank you for uh, watching the presentation. Really appreciate your time. Um, put some links uh, on this final slide here to register for free uh, onto uh, our procurement platform. As I briefly touched on uh, during the presentation, ProBrand offer a uh, digital solution um, that, that, that really answers all of the problems and the challenges I've been through in this presentation. Uh, our platform uh, has Europe's largest IT uh, catalog uh, with true live pricing and stock availability updates. We hold in there all of the education prices. There is a sector specific version uh, just for you uh, education customers. Um, uh, we hold in there things like special bid discounts and all of the things that I've, uh, I've mentioned in there. And it's completely free uh, for you to use uh, as well. So, uh, so the links are there to register uh, for the platform. Um, the, my contact details are on there as well. Um, there's also contact forms uh, on the website. So please uh, reach out to us for any questions or queries. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time.